hello, uh, I'm Harold Offay. And Michelle, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? We can... I will. Um, hello, I'm Michelle williams Um Very happy to be here. I'll say <laughs> for a minute. Very happy to have you here. Uh, so Michelle and I uh, are going to be in conversation. And this is part of a wider series called The Artist as Consultant. And um, we should really thank Helen Turner, uh, who's the Artistic Director and Curator at uh, AWERC. Lukenwalder, which I'm sure I've just massacred, apologies, um, who's kindly invited us to be part of this series um, with artists uh, in conversation with, um, I think they're people from curators and from different sectors. Um, obviously Michelle and I are both artists. Um, and I think maybe just to kind of sort of preface, um, we've sort of had an ongoing dialogue, I think, for, for a while. I think I was, um, you pulled out this really amazing picture, actually. But um, but we've we've known each other for about twenty years, I think, because of via new contemporaries, which I should just explain, because um, I think our audience is not just UK based. I think um, is a kind of graduate show um, for recent graduates. Um, so yeah, uh, that that's how we kind of first met, both being in that show and. Michelle was this amazing ingenue. I think I'd just done my MA, but I think you were just yeah. doing your BA, weren't you? Yeah, I think that's what I understand now that um, I'd just come in as a 21 year old and it was very much uh, the beginnings of me starting to begin with showing in a kind of professional context. So it, I was uh, somewhat starry eyed and excited by a lot of things, but I think that was very much the beginning. It's been really interesting to track what we've been doing over the last 20 years and even to sort of speak of 20 years, like um, the context of that show being, you know, a graduate show and now the two of us working quite a, a lot in higher education. Um, we can talk about that. I mean, for me as an artist, education has been um, not only a you know, something that I have needed, wanted, participated in, but I think about it a lot. And I think there are structural questions around that, around why I've been so situated in education, but at the same time, I absolutely am passionate about it. So it's this mix of needing to be there and because of that need, having to come up with ways to work, to make it, um, feel not only good for me but for my students so yeah yeah absolutely I mean I think we, we uh, just just for clarity where we our kind of conversation is sort of framed around um, <laughs> our education and really thinking through uh, our own practice and our experiences of, of teaching and learning context but also trying to think through and speculate maybe about um, future working practices or future models of art education um and yeah it's it's really apt that our, our meeting was um as products of art institutions in this kind of graduate show and um just to explain i think we as much as we have a structure um michelle and i are going to be doing um some a series of short presentations each in turn um and then we'll be speaking a little bit to those presentations and, and hopefully they'll give a bit of context about our own practice and maybe the intersections with kind of learning and education and pedagogical models within those presentations. And then I think we'll have a conversation that maybe speaks to those presentations because I've got I've got questions. Um, and then um, maybe just a sort of slightly wider kind of conversation with questions, maybe statements, provocations. Um, that speak to kind of future models or future pra or thinking about practices that might um, uh, be implemented or, or, or um, in relation to thinking about kind of art education. So as much as we have a structure, that is kind of sort of it. Um, so I think if, if it's okay with you, Michelle, maybe we'll go into the presentations and, and maybe also um, we could give a little bit of biography. I mean, you may be going to do this already, but I'm just yeah. keen to um, make sure that, yeah, people get yeah. a sense of who we are. No, thank you. Thanks, Harold, and thanks to Ava Lukenvall for this moment um, to have a, have a think, really, about what, 
what we've been doing. I always like these moments of reflection because um, it it does kind of consolidate a body of work or years of thought. Um, I'm a filmmaker predominantly, but I also work a great deal with performance and how film then intersects with installations. Um, performance really was the beginning of my art practice in many ways because it was the cheapest thing there was. There was my body, myself and some ideas and um, although I'm this funny mix of being shy and bold, I um, found it to be a really useful instrument and as I get older I get shyer but I also get um, bolder in how I speak and how I realise my voice might be resonating when I work with students. So I'm going to quickly start showing you some images. Um, just share the screen. <clears throat> Where have you gone? Excuse me. I love that. I love how it goes missing. Um, is that sharing, Harold? Yeah? Okay. So um, I'm just going to roll through some images of um, work that I have been doing in collaboration and also um, work that I've been doing initiating conversations that I've started with students. So this is a collaborative work with um, an American artist called Julia Kineski. But many of the works that we do look back to um, models of education um, that exist. So individuals like Ligia Clark, a Brazilian artist who um, was really practicing in the 60s and 70s, who came up with this idea of uh, corpo colectivo, the collective body, and someone who oh, sorry, who um, really tried to ask individuals to participate fully. So her classes are almost uh, bordering on, um, uh, fascist is the wrong word, but very strict in terms of, are you in or are you out? Are you going to um, work with me? And here is um, a reenactment of uh, a piece from 1973, I believe, called Baba Antropophagica, Cannibalistic Drill. And here, um, and the students were reenacting this incredible moment of um, pulling out multicolored threads from their mouth, drip, dripping really with saliva. You couldn't even possibly imagine doing this work in a COVID world um, at all. Um, but there you have it. We, um, we were able to share germs and um, actually recreate this incredible piece that really needs to be lived. It cannot be um, theorized or talked about. It needs to be participated in and within. Um, so here you see us wrapped, uh, wrapping, um, let me see, wrapping a body. This was a piece called Viagem. Uh, I can hear somebody knocking at the door. One second, this is ridiculous. Um, it, apologies. So yeah, this is um, a piece called Viagem, which again is a Leisure Clark piece where a body is wrapped and carried um, from the inside to the outside and taken on a journey. Um, the importance of these Brazilian uh, works for me um, are that they start to situate the body um, situate the body, situate the student into an experience. And that is so essential because, um, oh my God, my dog's here, sorry. That, that's so essential because um, I think sometimes class-based learning just doesn't, doesn't cut it. And I think I've been speaking with you, Harold, about the idea of um, situating my work back in the work, real world. Um, I've tried to do that consistently, taking students on ferries, teaching in parks, 
teaching in nail parlours. Um, and when I say teaching, it's also just living and sharing a communal experience. I don't want to be too top down about this. Again, here with Julia Koneski, this is with a group of Goldsmith students. Um, we performed at a, a show at the Copal Project in London called All About You. Um, thinking broadly about artists working with therapeutic models um, and really for me I don't really wish to think about students only as students I want to think about them as young artists at the beginning of their careers um, I've only selected here, this is making it look like I only work with my students but this is me giving a lecture in Hamburg and connecting with students at, at the Hamburg um, Academy and trying really to kind of not ridicule the space of academia but to kind of trouble it or destabilize it or even to destabilize my position as somebody with authority to give um, give over knowledge or you know to educate here i'm um you know eat it i'm, I'm really trying to kind of, that that's an apple i promise you that's um that's me trying to um conjure up things said and connect my legs to the audience and make them um also participant in the experience of what i'm saying um and yeah, for what it's worth, it seems to engage audiences and students in a, a deeper conversation. Um, and, it, and for me, it feels less dry, um, you know, academically and intellectually dry. I want people to actually be moved by what we are doing. Um, so, yeah, I'm just moving on to something that I did um, for Tintype and you also were part of this show Work Work which really situated, I love this show, um, it situated artists working in education and how we make alongside that and here is um, a script that I wrote that was uh, called Parting Gestures in which I was thinking about the students of 2017 who were just graduating and reflecting on the three years in which we both lived within the institution and I'm the first to admit that I'm heavily institutionalized you know and I try to um the, the script contained my words as a tutor a narrator and the student body who I envisage to be this morphing mutable collective that never you know were fixed they were mutable they were queer they were um transliterate they were non-homogenous um, and this was perhaps the most successful iteration of this where why um, that may have been the case was this was the first year in which I worked with students um, from multiple intersections and I would say that for once I was not the minority in that moment I had a group of mainly POC and queer um, um, artists and there was something and, and working class students it was really a very beautiful year for me if I think about that um, and again asking my students to participate in that it really is a co-performance I think if I had the chance to do future versions of this I'd really like to co-write a script I think I haven't yet done that and I think that would be the next step. Um, um, just moving on briefly to the strikes at Goldsmiths. Have I got time, Harold? Yeah. Um, yeah, the strikes at Goldsmiths, I would say, were very important. This was where in 2018 we were fighting for pensions, but now we're fighting for so much more in the kind of increasing marketization of higher education within the UK. But here we created an on the line picket residency in which there was a natural and understandable hiatus in the studios so again we brought the studios out to the four courts of goldsmiths and here we um, physically blocked the picket line um, and one thing I didn't ask of my students but was so moved by their solidarity was I sometimes teach as a, an alter ego 
a purple painted figure called Violet Colbo, mainly as a kind of uh, <laughs> a chance to kind of emancipate myself from the conditions of myself. I sometimes turn up as Violet to teach and I was quite nervous about doing this performance for a number of reasons, mainly because of blocking the entrance to the building. But um, I lay on the floor with a pink uh, copy of Paolo Freire's um, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And I, um, it was cold, I closed my eyes. I didn't know for how long I would manage to stick it out. I thought I'd last as long as the picket. But when I woke up, I, um, I found out that I was with a number of students lying on the floor with me. Um, and they also blocked the floor. Sadly, I, I don't have an image of that here, but the students that had planted these kind of fake rice paddy <laughs> um, into the cracks of, to kind of slow the movement of people across the threshold of the building chose to um, lie with me and also um, had these cyclops eyes drawn onto their foreheads so I was so moved by that because when I finally had the guts to open my eyes I found out that I was with them not you know not leading them but with them it was really moving um, yeah this is again continuing this but back in the context of Tate Exchange for work with Joe Addison and Natasha Kidd again you and I were in a similar platform but on different days where um, continuing to read this text, which actually names every student from 2017, becomes a kind of invocation, remembering bodies that move through institutions. Um, and I think that I want to constantly think about students, not as numbers, but as individuals. Um, finally, a, a project here um, called A Particular Reality, which is a collaboration with Kingston students and Goldsmith students. We found out and we know that many students of colour tend to um, yeah, feel atomised within higher education, also experience higher rates of dropouts, um, are unfairly penalised through things like unconscious bias, um, when it comes to their marks. And um, we tried to set up a kind of buddy network, a scheme where um, students could meet, share experience and begin to make work together. Um, and we created a, in, we created a exhibition, a collaborative exhibition at Kingston. And of course, um, we've now been hit by COVID, but we're now working on a, a zine that we hope to introduced to the first year welcome packs across Goldsmiths and Kingston. And if this is a useful toolkit for other universities, we'd like to roll that out. Yeah, this is just going back to the strikes, just to say the residency brought so many um, wonderful live performances, where here Calendar Dogan performs a soft Medusa who, um, who kind of petrifies people with her soft queer gaze. Um, and it was beautiful, the whole forecourt of uh, Richard Hoggart building outside Goldsmiths became this uh, stunned choreo choreographic space. Um, and yeah, we got to work with people's costumes and just, yeah, just make, um, make something happen. And I mean, this is a bit of a cheesy ending, but I love meeting students on the other side of the graduate, you know, even if we've been collaborating within the studios, there's something that happens when there's that very kind of nerve wracking year where they're on their own. But I love to meet them on that side because uh, they're beginning their journey as well. Okay. I'm back. That's great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank um, you. Yeah, I mean, that's a really kind of rich kind of overview. Um, I mean, there's, there's things we'll come back to in the kind of uh, in, in the kind of conversation, but um, it, yeah, I mean, I also loved as well how you're sort of pulling in, I think, these histories of pedagogical practices, artist practices, but also I think so immersed in, I think, um, responding to kind of context and sight. Um, and also the experiential, the sensorial, as 
pedagogical models, I think. Things that are, it's, I think with marketization, <laughs> uh, sort of can be easily sort of pushed out. So I think, again, uh, uh, things to kind of come back to and talk about. Sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm taking notes for, mm. yeah, I'd love to hear about what you've been doing. And... Okay. <laughs> um, so I'd like to follow. Uh, I'm, okay, I'm going to actually just talk about one project, actually, which was part of um, the, the Work, Work, Work show at, at, at Tintype. Um, and but but I think it speaks to I think um, a, an aspect of my teaching experience that I've sort of tried to kind of allied and work through kind of sort of practice. So um, I'll just share screen and okay. Oh, okay, here we go. So that's uh, okay. So. Um, the sort of starting point for this project. So the project is called Reading the Realness, but the starting point is sort of um, seems slightly tangential is um, my interest in sort of daytime talk shows um, and as discursive kind of forums within sort of popular culture. So um, this is this show, The Real, which airs in the US um, and it's an all women panel show. And again, that's a kind of convention within US daytime TV schedules and their various shows that kind of adopt this model. Um, and th <laughs> there's often a slightly weird disjuncture between like celebrity news and political commentary. Um, and the part of the format is about sort of spanning different forms of political kind of discourse. So you'll often have uh, Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives uh, as part of the kind of casting of this panel. Um, uh, so the the real is a very particular version in the US because it, it's constituted by women of colour um, and there's a slightly younger demographic. Um, I think the equivalent show in the, in the UK is called Loose Women and yeah. there may be other versions across Europe that I don't know about, but I'd be interested if people want to respond and let me know. Um, so um, the reason I've sort of referencing this clip is because um, I've been interested, I think, in thinking about how um, I think cultural, political, social issues are um, played through, I think, kind of popular discourse. Um, so whether that's television or online culture, social media culture, how conversation is shaped, or misshaped, I think, through um, the, the dissemination of those um, issues. Um, so thinking about that as a kind of uh, an area of kind of sort of discourse um, that exists outside of the academy in a way. Um, but I'm also really interested in the kind of structure of this, like this idea of casting and um, a sort of getting a sort of spectrum of views and it's, it's problematic, I'm not, it's not, while I'm kind of like into it, it's also deeply problematic in the way that it's also kind of structured. Um, but I, I was particularly kind of interested in, so this image actually is of um, conversation between the, the original cast of the women on the reel. And again, that's another thing I should talk about. The reel is, and, and the framing of that um, uh, for me is really interesting that the, the idea that, um, uh, the idea of authenticity, I think, um, which um, for me, I think echoes, I think an interesting kind of sort of like um, uh, notions of kind of identity and negotiation and, and, and um, the performance of identity. Um, and also how that is often linked, like this show is, it's called The Real and it's, it's made up of women of color. <laughs> um, and, and the kind of formulation of that in terms of, um, and what the, what the purchase is on that for these, these women. Um, but anyway, so this show is also, in this particular show, they're interviewing a woman called Rachel Dolezal, um, who was a bit of a cool celeb a few years ago, four or five years ago now. Um, for being transracial. So for this, I'm sure many people know, but for those who don't, she was outed by her white Caucasian family for living as an African-American woman. She was an, uh, an academic of African-American studies in Washington State, I believe. Um, was also, uh, I think, a chapter leader of the NAACP, 
um, a civil rights organization in the States. Um, and uh, so she was outed by her sort of sort of white conservative Christian uh, parents. Um, and there was a whole media furore around her um, sort of posing as a woman of color. And it sparked a lot of kind of debate and discourse. And, you know, there's a kind of Netflix documentary and there's been lots of articles kind of written about, about, about her. And, um, but so I was interested in how that debate um, was this sort of framed by then this experience of her coming on this show, The Real. Again, that's, <laughs> you know, the issue around her is her authenticity. Um, and also then the encounter, I think, with these women of colour with who have a very lived experience. Um, so what I did was to transcribe this YouTube clip of this kind of conversation between the two of them and turn that into a script. Um, and um, the idea of that process, I think, of scripting um, that conversation, I think, um, for me, it was an opportunity, I think, to kind of engage with something that I'd encountered, I think, through kind of teaching and is a kind of residual problem, actually, for me, uh, which is, I, I've had these sort of many situations of sort of teaching, and I've been interested to know what, what your opinions of this are as well, Michelle, where um, particularly within kind of critiques or seminars where um, there are, you know, students of colour or, or students who are, are queer or are speaking to particular subject position or particular kind of experience, or there's an experience within the work that is particularly culturally located, um, that, you know, there tends to be a kind of weird sort of silencing of like, you know, so uh, the student or the young artist is talking about a particular body of work that speaks to experience and then uh, people who feel that they're not part of that cultural identification, there is, there is, there is no kind of conversational dialogue that speaks to that. Um, and I, I always find that really, really kind of problematic, you know, in, in terms of um, particularly art school and art, and, and art education kind of context where I think conversation and honesty and exchange is really really important and I think often it's predicated on the fear of mostly if I'm being honest white students not wanting to be say things that might be deemed as being racist or misogynist or, uh, or homophobic or transphobic or you know so but, but that is then still a problem in that I think that the, the, the kind of sort of silence to in, or fear to engage with um, those artists who are who are presenting their work. So, so for me, I'm sort of been trying to find ways of allowing people to kind of speak to difference. Um, so yeah, the idea of scripting it so, um, was that um, what I was interested in using was this format of the kind of table read, which is something that, I mean, exists in, in sort of theatre contexts, primarily, or, or film contexts where the cast kind of comes together and there's an initial reading of the script. Um, uh, and what's interesting about that, I mean, I, I've, I've got a bit of a kind of sort of theatre background, um, mostly amateur, but um, it's, it's quite, it's explicitly that table read is about um, feeling your way into the text through the reading. So there's multiple readings. Um, it's about people getting a sense of the language and the weight of the language. Uh, through the experience of reading and performing the character kind of out. And it's a really, for me, inherently kind of open pedagogical space where, you know, it's not about the polished performance, it's about getting to grips with the way that things are said and the way that things are kind of framed. Um, and there might be dialogue and exchange around the, the reading. So it informs... Um, the, the kind of presentation of perform and performance. So um, when I was sort of asked to, to be part of kind of work, 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 which is, as Michelle said, it was a really, really great project that was sort of inviting artists um, who are sort of working in educational context to kind of frame that practice. And I must thank Joe Addison and, and, and um, the other curators who really, I think, um, 
really incredibly sort of generous in sort of bringing the project together. Um, so I had an opportunity, the first opportunity really to kind of like use this transcript and test this transcript and uh, and Joe Addison was incredibly generous in, in helping me and um, uh, so the, the project was performed by a group of students from Kingston uh, where Joe teaches um, and um, again it's, it's explicitly I didn't want there, there was no prior rehearsal again I think for me what's important about the kind of sort of table read is that there's a sort of kind of coming together um, and it's an initial reading everyone's at the same point um, and I explicitly wanted a very kind of diverse cast again that would so, so that sense in which I think people weren't necessarily um, would be in a position where they might be reading you know the position of an Asian American woman or an African American woman or Rachel Dolezal someone who identifies as African American um, so the script is kind of formatted in a way that um, there were three readings, three, and um, each time uh, we read through the script, or I should say they read through the script, um, uh, each performer played a different character. So they performed a different sort of, um, a different person. Uh, so there were kind of three Rachel Dollars Owls and um, so it was an opportunity to hear how different people, um, the different performers spoke to diff the different characters' words. Um, and also importantly, I think it was also an opportunity for the audience to hear that text three times and the repetition of that text is also, I think really, really important, I think for me. Um, so, and um, again, I think, what was really interesting, and I think <clears throat> is something that, uh, as I've sort of done this a few times as performance, is as much the discussion that comes afterwards. So there's a bit of discussion that we had afterwards with the, with the audience, and um, uh, that included um, uh, Michelle and some of this, this, the other students that, from Goldsmiths that she was working with, plus sort of visitors who came to, to uh, the series of performances that were happening. So I was really interested in that that way that I think I I hope that the script allowed, maybe awkwardly, but people to kind of speak to, even if they might be awkward about what Rachel was saying and the way she was framing it, they could speak to the experience of reading what she was saying, um, and and they could maybe get a sense of how a particular argument or position was being framed or put or positioned um there was a sense of a kind of sort of dialogue across um <clears throat> across the different characters that were in play um so i've sort of subsequently in different contexts and different shows sort of like again with this rachel dollars our script kind of gone and it's been sort of performed in, in different contexts so this is in leeds um uh, um a show that i did at a gallery called the tetley in leeds um again with different different performers um and yeah but using the kind of sort of same format um of the read through which is about sort of 20 minutes half an hour and then there's half an hour of kind of discussion from the audience and the performers sort of speaking um and we did a kind of couple of iterations on one iteration i i, I wanted to experience doing it myself so i i I was um, as well, sort of like reading um, the different the different characters, and I, I think um, for me, um, it's become something. I mean, I've sort of been sort of looking for a way of kind of like taking this work on because it's about a methodology. I think for me, um, and while that script I think is very specific to the discussion around Rachel Dolezal, um, kind of like you, um, Michelle, I, I think. I'm sort of quite interested in extending the process a bit and um, sort of working uh, with with students and it might be my own students or opening it out um, to other participants perhaps where we are initially identifying what the texts are. Um, I think this transcription thing is kind of important in terms of, uh, you know, that, that idea of um, identifying debates and discussions that exist within sort of popular culture and public discourse. 
um, often just because they're problematic in the, way, in the way that they're kind of framed. Um, and yeah, and sort of performing and staging this, and it, it's it's something that I'm I'm increasingly sort of wanting to use within sort of teaching context, but also I think um, within sort of gallery or, or, or um, I guess sort of social arts context that I might I might be sort of operating in. Um, so that's the last image. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, I think. Yeah, we're kind of doing okay. Yeah, it's, for, uh, yeah I'm keeping an eye. It's so good to um, see that, and you just at the end of your talk, Harold, you talked about um, the methodology of this deployment of the script. Um, and like you, uh, first of all, I, I love the format of the script, partly because it it does pin down uh, language. So scripts, are, in my understanding of scripts. Uh, incredibly efficient vessels for um, you know okay this is a transcription with the real but even so once it's transcribed it artic you know it articulates a moment in time and um, it feels for me quite efficient within the context of a daytime tv show or the context of a theatre space or film like it says what it has to say and there's like a kind of narrative arc so for me, I'm interested in that because when you earlier on in your conversation, you, you, you explained that sometimes there's this weird silencing that happens with students. I've witnessed it myself and I have to kind of work really hard to hold the silence sometimes because there's a part of me that wants to smooth it over and make it okay, usually for the artist of colour who's speaking, but I think I'm learning as I work longer in education to just let that excruciating silence hold because I think it's not enough for us to um, participate in watching somebody show something, you know, not only through, we can't just be witnesses or, but you know, it feels then that we're bystanders to something but we're not the thing of making that transition into then stumbling over reading the text for me, maybe as part of that methodology of asking people to be accountable or to, um, to not shirk from joining, joining it, no matter what subject position you have. And I, I love the possible space of empathy there. Um, that you're opening up in the in the co-reading space. Yeah, absolutely, and I, th I think that's so kind of crucial. But particularly, I think um, uh, you know, I think we, if we talk about the co the context of kind of art education, which I think uh, often I think you know we're exposed, we're quite exposed. It's quite a vulnerable space. Um, I mean, regardless even of what your sub the subject matter of your work is, whether it's it's sort of sensitive material, mm -hmm. I think it's it's a sort of vulnerable space, and I think that mm -hmm. that that kind of sort of empathy and kind of community is is sort of really Im important, I think, to kind of foster and um, engender in, in in into these spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a, a sort of I think there's something sort of more broadly that I was sort of t taking um, from your presentation, Michelle, mm -hmm. which was, uh, I think, how you're aware, I think, of a certain, like, setting the conditions in, in, in particular ways. So I was thinking about how, I think, within much of what you were presenting, there was this sense of, like, a real awareness, acute awareness of context. Mm -hmm. Like, um, so... Uh, I mean, a skewing kind of institutional kind of critiques, just, you know, the idea of like um, the space of the kind of everyday mm. um, and operating in different spaces. So like, you know, um, so the, the education is constituted by a body of people, not just a building right. or, or facilities even. And then structures i think in the way that things are kind of sort of shaped whether again not necessarily physical structures but again maybe that speaks to kind of sort of methodologies and processes um that allow things to happen mm -hmm. and then 
Um, a couple of other things, I think for me, maybe it's allied to kind of like structures, but hierarchies, I think you're sort of breaking hierarchies because again, one can think within education, um, there are these implicit, obviously kind of hierarchies um, that are kind of sort of set up. And I think um, the negotiation of those and the transparency of those, I think is sort of really important. Yeah. And then just last the experiences. I think you you foregrounding the experiential. I think sorry, that's lots of things, but I just wanted to. No, thank you. I love I love it when someone can kind of uh, see that. And um, I think we were at an exciting period in education in that. I think I've always um, you know craved an educational space uh, for my own well being, and then outside of that. I understand that my students have to, um, at some point, look inwards at their, their themselves and who they and identity does come up so very much. And I'm not really that um, happy about individuals that kind of shun that as identity politics or, you know, because that. I think we've been doing this for years as artists, you know, just to kind of say, just to try to kind of dismiss the experiential of an individual seems to me so kind of harsh. We've been, we've been allowed, you know, every artist book anthology that I've looked at has gone deep within, you know, each artist's respective positions. And to now our students who are, um, you know, from the millennial generation to penalise them for doing the same, but seems crazy because actually they're articulating something um, very, very profoundly real to me, coming back to this word real and, you know, dare I say it, authentic, you know, there's something. So the idea then of offering a structure that might um, potentially um, destabilize the hierarchy of education seems a really rich space to explore. I don't, I think I'm nervous of um, gathering a certain level of power. As you get older, you're given more space to speak. And in that space, I think we have to be very careful with how that's um, distributed. So for the students, I want to do something that feels real in the sense that um, so much of our engagement is now digital and screen based. It certainly is during this period that we're going through now. But even so, I want to somehow resuscitate um, a 70s multi-sensorial performance. I want to um, remember the words of an artist that said something that touches me and I want to share, you know, so I, and similarly, when voices are heard and when we don't have that terrible silence in the context of a kind of art crit, we, we can sort of hear the vulnerability that we, you were talking about, um, that kind of plays out in the daytime TV show and in the readings of um, your subsequent readings of the real. It, for me, it's like, actually, I'm okay with a classroom. I don't even work in a classroom, but uh, I'm okay with uh, the context of education that is precisely vulnerable. And I'm not trying to elide that with um, the therapeutic, actually. I, I really love to look to therapeutic models but I think that um, it's okay to express hurt or try to articulate your current moment with your identity, which is ever changing. You know, that, that seems to be something I've learned from my students. I, they can really vehemently tell me about their specific position on one, in one term. And by the end of that academic year, they've moved on and they look different and they say different things and it's absolutely fine. But I really love that material of, of trying to say it. 
that that to me is the work that to me is part of our co-learning and so yeah I, in that text that you mentioned that i wrote recently uh, from a book on decolonizing um, education yeah i was going to ask I, you yeah. yeah i ended by saying let's all be on the ground mm -hmm. you know i'm i don't want to be you know here with them there i like the proximity i like the shared vulnerability i know that that can get messy but it certainly seems like it, it generates more you know in terms of conversation i mean can i ask you about you used a term open pedagogical space which to me feel, seems like there's a correspondence with what i'm trying to achieve like what what if we were moving towards thinking of future models what what would that look like for you given that both of us seem to work a great deal in higher education and within the context of galleries and museum education mm. where do you where would this go if you could be part of shaping a, a different strategy for more different I, mean, I, I think it's for me it's about a degree of kind of transparency and um i think sort of again sort of slightly undermining those our hierarchies and authorities. I mean, I think, um, I mean, maybe I can speak to it through an exercise that we used to do in Leeds, actually, um, with, the, with the first year students, um, where we actually presented them to them in, in the first couple of weeks, different models of art education. Um, so everything from sort of Bauhaus and Black Mountain College to um, more artist-led, um, more activist kind of sort of models, you know, referencing the situationists, I think activist groups in Latin America um, and, and Asia as well. Um, and we asked them to, um, well, they, they sort of were randomly kind of given them, but, so, but we asked them to kind of go away and research those and to come back and present back to the wider kind of sort of view group so mm -hmm. that then there was this discussion where people were presenting or performing to or um, these different models of, of art education. And then there was a discussion about, you know, how, what people thought about them and what and and um, what what were the things that were really kind of sort of drawn to. So at the beginning point before going into this um, art school, which was sort of joining in Leeds, that they were getting a sense of a greater kind of sort of perspective of different approaches to kind of sort of learning. Um, uh, so I think for me that was just an, an, it, in, in the sense that, again, maybe that sp speaks to the kind of sort of peer group kind of sort of learning in which I think you're facilitating and you're equipping people with the means and tools to have a purchase on mm. their, their own learning. Because really, I mean, like art school, university, any sort of educational institution for me should really function to enable individuals and groups to to to, to for their own self-education you know it's kind of just it, it's a kind of sort of nurturing facilitation of people's own self-education um and so it's not necessarily being about prescriptive so i think for me that that spoke to the idea of a degree of kind of transparency and sort of saying well actually in seeing these other education models, you have a purchase on what we're doing, right. and maybe <laughs> after you know, um, you know, experiencing um, Sundown Schoolhouse, which is a kind of like a sort of '90s LA kind of sort of sort of hippie, post hippie, <laughs> slacker kind of sort of um, pedagogical model. Um, you have a particular critique of the way that we're doing things, maybe, and and that's you know so. Um, Can I see how how did they experience it? Did they look at it with distance, or did they kind of try out a session of of that? Or because it sounds really, it sounds almost like a possible game show in itself, or data reality show where we're like, you know, like something like the Crystal Maze, where you send people into the, you know, the I don't know what zone that would be, you know, the medieval zone. Or <laughs> 
I mean, it sounds amazing, actually. Imagine if we could just set up a. I'd be I'd be thrilled to set up a a whole space where each room allowed you to live it, you know, for a while. I think we should. I think we should do it. I mean, in a way, it was quite. It was quite more limited in scope. In that, um, no, it was you know, they had a couple of days, and some people had a real purchase on it and really got into, um, you know, using some of the kind of strategies and creating like images and text works, and other people, um, it was a bit more of a kind of research by exercise. But I, I think that was also to do with. Uh, whether people were into those models or not. So for me, it was also interesting that um, because they, they randomly got chosen. They didn't, you know, um, some people may have found themselves in a particular model they just weren't comfortable with. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's something I've thought about actually that we could kind of sort of extend. I mean, I know if, God, a good few years ago, um, the Haywood did this show, this open school show, yeah. um, where they invited different artists to um, program sort of classes. Um, I mean, it was the sort of zenith of that, where there was a kind of educational, pedagogical kind of turn, and there was a lot of curatorial um, interest in kind of educational. I mean, it that slightly sort of waned now, but but yeah, so it, they, they sort of programmed different artists putting on, um, different sort of classes and different so presenting sort of different models. I've still got documentation of that actually because I, I engaged I, with a few things. But but yeah, I mean our thing was specifically speaking to like these um historical models. And then yeah, it, it, it it's yeah, we only did it as a very short exercise, but it, it could be so much richer, I think, in yeah. giving people a chance to really immerse themselves in it. It makes me think, um, it's reminding me that I used to start some of my um, getting to know students by asking them to um, fill out Paul Tech's uh, teaching notes from Cooper Union, um, which I think were when he taught there in the late 70s. Mm. And some of the questions in that questionnaire are questions that would just not really be asked by tutors today, like things like, tell me about your most frightening perversity or, <laughs> you know, just these, you know, just these really probing questions that, that don't have to be divulged or not, but just started to make people realize the potential for questions that could be asked, mm -hmm. you know, particularly because I work on a BA course and the, the chasm of difference between students who come from an A-level, um, which is our UK context of being, you know, seven, 16, 17, 18, moving to a university context where all of a sudden all that kind of top-down hierarchy of uh, education starts to loosen, hopefully, if depending on the kind of course you get, and things begin to start being much more about the student who is self-motivated and responsible for their own education. So what you're saying to me about um, a facilitation of a space where peer learning takes, takes the centre is wonderful because that's, I think that we must equip artists with that, you know, students who are younger artists with that just on the basis of preparation for life really um but I, I i don't know it's sort of i think that i would i'd love to try out this kind of multi multi-purpose space with models where we you know where you actually kind of actually put in a bit more embodiment mm. so you know even to the point of wearing specific clothes and <laughs> like we could be Californian hippies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and and build geodesic domes and like that's sort of something. Um <laughs> uh, I'm aware of a little bit of time and I, I just want I, I, in a way we're talking about it anyway, I think we're sort of addressing this, but um I, I think in I think speaking about kind of um future models or speaking to future models. I mean, I, I think for me, when I was thinking about this, actually, I was sort of aware that actually um, 
you know, it, I think one can't so, sort of just speak to, I think, our education within a higher education context, I think. Um, again, maybe this is specific to a UK context, but I'm aware that um, we're living politically, a very political, politically hostile environment with um, a con very conservative right-wing government, which is definitely, I think, eroding um, arts education, particularly within school. And something I'm kind of conscious of is that, um, you know, teaching institutionally uh, within art schools and higher education, um, actually the kind of foundations of that, which is primary school education and, and uh, secondary high school education, is being really eroded to art subjects in the UK are being increasingly sidelined. Um, students uh, have often very have little access or what's even more disturbing is that it's very disparate depending on where you are located in the country there isn't a sense of a uniform experience or access to art music and drama education uh, some students have very good experiences some don't uh, and often that's allied to where you might live and, and class disparities and economic disparities I think all so I'm just kind of partly I know that's not necessarily what we've been talking about so much no, I think those important. two things are linked and I know obviously Michelle you're a parent as well yeah. um, so you might have particular kind of views on that mm -hmm. but I think that that it, certainly in the UK is going to really really affect who is engaged in our education in the next <laughs> few years mm -hmm. and what their and the differences in their experiences yeah. um, yeah we've, already, yeah, we've already seen that playing out with higher fees for universities and also post-COVID or during this period of COVID, I've read a paper that the government may, for primary and secondary um, schools, you know, reduce or stop what they call non-essential subjects. Now I know that that's another word for art, which breaks my heart because it it seems to me unbelievable that we don't centre art as a core curriculum subject. Mm -hmm. I really mean this. Like it's as fundamental to me as physical education and all the STEM subjects of science and maths. And, you know, I just want to hope that we can get to a more progressive space with our government. But this is across the world where we are... Um, that, and I guess that's why I keep looking back to places like the 60s and 70s where um, artists really tried to locate art back into society um, with, you know, at the core of everything, you know. So, um, but of course we need money and time and resources and I, I'll always campaign for that. It's like, mm. a, it's... A, it's a given that that seems to me the only way will be um, a, a more functioning society, you know, a kinder society. But I know that art can have a role in that. It just seems that other people might not believe that. <laughs> Governments, I may mean, I say. So. Exactly. I mean, I think. Um... I mean, I think one of the things that's been interesting for me is, um, is I think, you know, in, again, in the UK context, and, and I think we're both really interested in, I mean, I, I know this has got an international reach, I think interested in how people might respond in their own particular context. And I think an important catalyst of this, I would, I would be really interested to know in what, what is happening across Europe and across um, North America and Asia and Africa and South America, you know, as, as far as this reaches out, if people can, if, if people want to respond and, and let us know, because I'm, again, that, that exchange and dialogue is really important. But um, it's been interesting, I think, that there's been a lot of, like, peer-led or um, self-organised educational models that have sort of, um, sort of sprung up in 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 the UK, I think that's partly a response to the marketization and commercialization of kind of art education in the UK. It's increasingly expensive, um, you know, to do uh, undergraduate and graduate um, postgraduate education. Um, and um, I mean, there's a really interesting, useful publication by Sam Thorne, who's director of um, Nottingham Contemporary, 
um, which is like a recent history of self-organized art education. And um, he was also one of the founders of Open School East, which is an example of um, a sort of alternative um, art school kind of sort of model that's um, now based in Margate, I think, in, on the south coast. But there are kind of others in existence, um, School of the Damned, um, Syllabus, which I've been involved with, um, and various others. And I think that, that I think is a kind of a, I think it's a reflection of a kind of institutional crisis, but also I think what we're maybe leaning towards and thinking about a future kind of direction. Um, uh, I'm not saying that's a kind of complete um, problematic utopia, but um, yeah, so I wonder if you want to just speak to that or it might be. Um, yeah, I'm wondering as fees become more and more um, hard to incur, to incur that debt, um, when very little is offered, once you leave um, the course, there's no guarantee of employment and anyway we know as artists that that one's a speculative possibility anyway. Um, I suppose I hope for more of these um, self-governed spaces. Um, I, I would like to be part of that process at some point. If I could also um, find a way to um, not always be so situated within an institution that's established, I think um, we have to start building new new groups uh, that maybe don't really need that many facilities. I think maybe it's once we get into a space of, I think teaching during COVID has started to make that clear. While I really believe in us being physically together, we don't always uh, maybe need all the facilities that um, make polished works, you know, you know, degree shows that look really fancy may, um, be one model, but another model could be this kind of more uh, discursive space that you and I have shown through our examples where it looks a bit more rough around the edges, but um, actually what's being generated is a discourse that goes deeper. And um, I, I just I just don't, I, I want to talk to more artists about this really, because I think that we do hold some of the keys, but we also need, um, we need institutions to open up maybe to offer us a space or we just go um, renegade and find our own. But, um, but also we need energy <laughs> to do this. But I, I just, I, I do get excited that there are other models out there. And I know that the one that I'm currently situated in is um, just one of those models, you know. And maybe it's becoming antiquated, you know, so. We're unfortunately running out of time, I and mean, I think that I think that, you know your, your summing up there was really great in terms of ad addressing I think these possible kind of sort of pathways and and thinking through sort of practice. I sort of wanted to end by just reminding because I think what's been really useful in the last couple of weeks is the resource that you were part of, so the decolonizing the curriculum, the museum, and the mind, um, which is something I think you you develop you were. It was a sort of longer process. Do you just want to explain? Sorry, I'm. Uh, well, of course, yeah. um, it's something that um, Mark Smith, um, who's a curator and educator himself, um, has been working with with um, an academy in Lithuania um, in Vilnius, and um, I was invited with a number of other speakers to talk to that almost the decolonizing turn that we've seen happening in the last year or so and um, it was um, a transcribed um, a series of transcribed um, lectures that happened um, across um, a week of learning with uh, the PhD program there um, so it's been uh, it's a free resource and um, maybe we can share that yeah. um, and maybe we could even share our scripts or something I don't know it might be interesting if we do the Q&A to um, share some more resources and yeah it was basically a moment to think about 
the D word of decolonizing. We've also had like the D word of diversity within uh, the UK context. But I think the more we say it, the more it will become uh, less of a word and more of a thing. Because um, I think that um, many of us are trying really hard to expand our references and to expand uh, the experience of teaching. And, you know, like I said to you when we were preparing for this, I've I never had a tutor of colour, I just didn't uh, throughout my education and I I don't, I can't even process that. I, I, I have, but I can't process it and I just know that something is uh, changing. And I, and I mean that not only for students of colour, but for students who, um, fr from any background, it is so important that we teach together, you know, and, and that students see that so um, and that just really takes some shifts in attitude really um, so a bit I just I guess I'll constantly bang that drum because I'm at the forefront of that in my own being but um, hopefully that's yeah. good. It's that feminist mantra deeds not words yeah, yeah. Deeds, <laughs> not words, exactly <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, oh, really, pleasure. really appreciate you um, being on this with me. Yeah, it's, I'm really um, happy, happy to have this moment to talk, yeah. and I've taken lots of notes because I'm quite. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> I want to. I want to think about it some more with you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We'll we'll continue talking, and hopefully, we'll get some some of those resources maybe out. And I think there might be an opportunity for a Q and A, which would be really interesting to to, to hear from people. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.